Yes. Hello, everybody, dear audience, lecturers, students, and all interested people out there. We are very happy to welcome you to another book launch. And I'm really happy to have the chance to give my warm welcome to the editors of the book, International Human Rights, Social Policy and Global Development, Phelim Oet Mail and Jeremy Ken. And as well, we are welcoming one of the authors, Professor Peter Herman. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening to you. Good evening. Hello to you. Thank you very much for giving us your time all around the world. Because it isn't that easy to come together to the times that we have now, we are doing it on a digital version. And before we speak about your book, I thought about giving a short presentation of your biographies. But to be honest, after I'm reading your biographies, I thought I could never do it right. I would have two possibilities. One, I would say too much and the audience will be bored at all. Or I don't say <laughs> enough and you will never do another book launch with me. So please feel free to give it just a short wave cut about yourself and let us hear why you use this topic and how you come to write a book about this really, really important thing. Phelim, may you start? Uh, I have to start first. Uh, my name is Phelim O'Hamill. I, uh, I live in Ireland. Um, I have, I'm a lecturer in social policy at the uh, University, uh, University College Cork, which is right at the south of Ireland. And uh, I come from the north. I come from Belfast. Um, and most of my life has been spent in Belfast. My background is primarily... Uh, not so much an academic background. It's been uh, involvement in NGOs, voluntary sector organizations, community organizations, campaigning organizations. And um, my academic work reflects that in the sense that my research is primarily geared towards looking at issues of injustice, inequality, um, uh, exclusion. And uh, in terms of the book itself, I mean, my, my main interest in the book, I suppose, initially was that I teach a module on human rights and uh, social policy. And I couldn't find a book which covered everything that I wanted to cover with the class. Uh, and I felt that it, it would be useful to produce a book which would be useful for students to find out about human rights and the application of human rights in social policy development, but also for NGOs, people who worked in NGOs, community activists, voluntary sector activists, people who are involved in campaigns, that they would have a tool, a, a method by which uh, through the book, they could understand human rights mechanisms, international human rights mechanisms, and use those, those mechanisms as a tool to advance policy development, to, to advance their, their campaigns, to raise awareness, etc. And I suppose that's where I'm coming from in relation to the book. I wrote something down. I would come back to it for some time later. So please, Gerard, how did you come to this topic? Okay, my, my name's Gerard McCann. Um, I lecture in St. Mary's University College, which is a college of Queen's University in Belfast. Um, I specialize in international development, international studies. Um, and I also run the, um, I'm head of the international office um, in our college, um, basically sending st students and staff out and um, bringing students and staff in whenever possible. Um, my um, background in, in this subject, which is international uh, human rights, social policy and global development really goes back to um, my education into the subject, indeed. Um, I've um, many years working in this field. Um, I would align it to development studies. Um, I would align it to my work in regards to, for example, migration, 
um, which is which is a, the, the topic of the minute in Europe, as we know, tragically. Um, and also in, in relation to the way in which policies interconnect around the issues of human rights and indeed the development of a more um, sort of humane and sustainable society uh, within which we, we can develop. Um, I've also over many years been working um, in a voluntary capacity um, with the homeless um, in Belfast city particularly. Although I did go over to Glasgow on one occasion to just to compare the uh, the response by government um, there and um, still, uh, I mean, then and now a disastrous um, series of policies that has dehumanized quite a section of the population on these islands. Um, and more recently, I've been working with our refugee and asylum seeker community, specifically the African community um, that has arrived in Belfast in particular um, over the past possibly 10 years um, and currently assisting in running um, a number of programs with PhD students, um, indeed, around English language learning, around um, orientation in terms of form filling, for example, um, and also trying to ensure that, um, that, that their stay in this region is as comfortable as possible um, un until they're processed or accepted um, for their, their refugee status, which is the goal. Um, so that's, that's been, for me, probably 30 years work. Um, I've a dozen books in and around the subject. That's been probably one of the most interesting that I've been in engaged in. Um, one of the most useful, I have to say, in terms of teaching. Um, and it, it feeds into various other aspects of, of um, academic life and indeed indeed the lecturing that, that I would do in and around these subjects. So that's, that's me. Thank you very much. If I understand it well, you both are really field workers during the last years and have a lot of expectation around it. And Professor Dr. Peter Herman, one of the authors in the book, he is right now one of the most far people I know in China. And he is more in social politics, if I understood it well. Well, that's a good question. Um, coming to the end of my career now, uh, I started actually as well doing specific things, working especially on European social policy, uh, indeed, and um, ex what had been called at the time social exclusion, uh, which actually had been about poverty more than anything else. Uh, there had been an interesting debate. It was as well very academic, and I say no, kind of jokingly, but as well kind of being serious about it. Coming to the end of the, my career, <clears throat> I'm uh, becoming more, not humane, but human oriented, meaning on real life, because academia is very nice. Uh, you are dealing with people, you are dealing with students, and you, you should try as well to, to be close to them. But at the same time, it is an area, I was actually yesterday walking across the campus, uh, here in China, uh, we have a special residential area for the retired people. And I was thinking what I had been told, uh, if it's possible in the area as well, what I had been once shown in uh, Sweden, people very proud uh, showing us the campus, saying that you'd never have to leave it. Uh, you can be born there, you can live there, you can be retired there. and. Finally, you have to leave it at some stage. Uh, but that's the last time you are there. There are shops, there is everything. So the academic world is um, interesting. It is important without any doubt. But what we frequently forget is that we are dealing or that we should be dealing uh, with people's everyday life. And I think uh, from uh, the position I have now, I'm here professor for human rights. 
uh, at the Human Rights Center Law School uh, that we, in many cases, not here, but in general, in academic work, forget that we are talking about or that we are working on people's everyday life. Human rights, we have all the declarations, we have all the papers and documents in, uh, in, in uh, New York, in Vienna, in other places, uh, but there are no people. There is, it's, I, I can say a little story from the last General Assembly. Uh, where one uh, prime minister, I don't know, uh, said she stood up <clears throat> giving her main speech and she said, I won't give the speech that had been prepared for me to give you. I won't say what I usually would say, but I will say that we are not a single step further than we have been three years when I gave my main speech. And this is, I think, the, the important point here, that we, we have all these beautiful looking documents, we have all these speeches, but really to go there where people live in their everyday life, that is something important. Uh, and, and this is where I say as well, we are talking still, of course, and importantly about the big question of migration and um, uh, poverty and 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 but what it really means this was as well my uh, experience in brussels that uh, the commissioner said to me we, we need people like you who are looking at what what life is about uh, we have as well all the documents we have the policies in place but we, we have difficulties to reach the people and i think that that's my concern really um, even writing or contributing to an academic book, uh, but but to show that uh, we have had actually yesterday or the day before we have had a meeting here uh, on on human rights and democracy. Uh, it is not about the figures, it's not about the laws, but it is how we really take part in society, how we perceive human rights or not. And this, I think, is uh, clearly shown during the last two years now, um, the, the pandemics, uh, where many things came up actually that are not linked really to pandemics, but that had been accelerated there, that had been more obvious, uh, that permanently exist. And we are blind as academics as uh, officials, as politicians, and so on and so forth. So that's my, my position. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, Phelim and Gerard, I think it's very interesting what Peter said, that the academics are too far away from what people really need. Was that your goal with the book, to hear authors and their voices full of courage, humanity and integrity and to sharpen the view for the being of human people? I'm not sure if you want me to answer that or not, Jared. Um, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, go. I, I think that if you look at the book, the book's divided up into three sections and um, uh, two of the sections look at issues um, specific issues, human rights issues, and most of those people who are contributing to the, the second two uh, uh, sections of the book um, would be involved in NGOs and voluntary sector organizations and campaign organizations. And indeed, the ones who are involved in the first section of the book, which is primarily uh, providing a critical analysis uh, and description of the main international human rights mechanisms, which mm -hmm. Uh, exist for Europeans primarily. Uh, um, the book's primarily geared towards Europeans, I suppose, but it, it could be of interest to people in America and people in Asia and China and all the rest of it. Um, but um, even though within this that particular section, we have people like myself and Jared, for example, have contributed. Peter has contributed to, to, to chapters in that section, and we have other people involved. Uh, Dana Budu, for example, um, uh, Palestinian um, uh, activist. Um, so there's so been a range of, of, of authors, 25 authors in total. Um, the vast majority of them have worked at 
grassroots level on, on, on a range of different issues in, in relation to, to human rights and uh, social exclusion, etc. So yes, the answer to your question, it's very important to make this practical. It seems to me that from, from my perspective anyway, uh, it's, this isn't just about theorizing and, and, and an academic exercise. It's about um, trying to provide something practical that people at grassroots level can actually use uh, and, and benefit from. I think just, just to back that up um, in terms of what um, I think all the, all the authors considered this to be, which was effectively a project. Um, I mean, the idea of bringing together people who would be um, from a, an activist or from an NGO background and then linking that into academic research and indeed policy analysis, um, I think was, was innovative. And I think it also helped to develop a, a connection between the various organizations that we worked with um, and the academics involved. So it brought the research and the data development together and it, it held an ethos of sorts over the, the, the generation of um, a sequence of chapters that um, I think ultimately, if I was to go through them again, there's a very strong sort of current of um, sort of humanism or humanity or or that attempt to try to, to bring forward a better understanding of human rights through the lens of human development. And uh, that, that, that's the way I looked at it, certainly as a, as a project primarily, um, and linking in with these issues from the perspective of those who are the, the, the subjects of human rights law, for example, or those who are um, suffering under a lack of human rights or pressures on their human rights, and uh, the outcome of that, I think, is 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 this this particular initiative, um, and it, it's quite well received. And in terms of teaching and outreach, um, it's become quite a useful tool to promote a human rights approach to um, policy making, to the development of society in general, indeed. Um, and also to try to give our students an understanding of, of the importance of human rights from the perspective of those people who are subject to the law um, regarding human rights. Thank you very much. Um, you already mentioned it, that there are three main parts, so historical development, universal approaches, and social policy development. I mean that are different topics and very critical perspectives which come together in the book because of your 24 authors all together. And that provides a wide range of experiences and meaning in the chapters. Um, do you think to offer such different and on part really critical perspectives about the common sense beliefs, is this needful to discuss right now when we look at our world? Maybe Peter, is he already there? I am there um, and in a way, that I'm there and that I'm okay, not there uh, is part of it. We are living in a, in a kind of cocoon. And we, I mean now, uh, those who have the privilege uh, of having permanent access to the internet, having permanent connections to this and that. And uh, we do not see the real problems of what it means for different people, for very different people, uh, availing of human rights or not. And this is in a way a different angle or saying the same from, from a different angle with what I said before. Yeah. Uh, we, we are talking about usually, uh, and I say we now, we the privileged, about the breach of um, civil rights, political rights. 
Uh, I live now kind of being forced to live in Germany for one and a half year. I couldn't leave, I couldn't go back because we in China have a strict policy called zero COVID, um, which means it was kind of funny. Uh, I read in the paper the other day, we have 19 cases, confirmed cases of COVID, meaning we have measures in place that it doesn't spread. Uh, I talked those days to a friend of mine, she's a teacher. There have been eight uh, pupils in the class of her grandchild, and they kind of have been relaxed about it. Uh, and you see the situation, the difference, what it means in Germany, in, uh, in, uh, in, in China. Now, not all measures are convenient, but there is the security of uh, of having what well, well of not needing treatment and of getting treatment if you need it. As I said, I lived uh, one and a half years uh, being in Germany, not being able to come back for different reasons. Uh, if I see that fourteen people are living on hundred square meter in one of the richest countries of the world, and this is Germany. 14 people on 100 square meter. And this is not an exception. We should not talk about, is it correct to talk about, now these are important issues, but is it important um, to, to have the gender star or these things? There are very fundamental issues. And that's the same with women's rights. There are more fundamental issues than having the I or whatsoever. There are the fundamental issues that we still have uh, inequality in terms of payment, that we still have violence against women because of the social situation, because of the, the material conditions. These are, I think, more important issues. We can, of course, we have to acknowledge that there is discrimination taking place in all the areas, but, but what is really important is uh, so I won't say the name, but everybody knows it is the existence, it is the real life that uh, is um, determining the consciousness. We all know this beautiful sentence. It is not about first we think and then we are, but first we are and then we think. And this is, I think, if I consider, if I, when, when I heard it, I, to be honest, I couldn't believe 14 people, and this is not an exception in the capital of the chamber of, of, of the one of the richest countries. Um, we have uh, issues about uh, fascists and um, attacking uh, attacking migrants, or not even migrants, but, but uh, what is called today uh, people with migratory background, I think. Uh, there are the material situations, it, it's still uh, the segregation in society, the objective situation, and this is, I think, we have to look at as the, it is the objective situation of ordinary people. Uh, this is, I think, important, and there it is as well. The, you, you, you have huge differences, of course, uh, if you look at countries like um, uh, like Germany uh, and France. I take this two countries, uh, the situation of migrants, of Muslim, is a completely different one uh, than it is in Germany. In France, you have the, the tradition, you have the, uh, the, the tradition of, of migrants, you have uh, the, well, you, and you have laicism. Uh, the, the, there, the question of the head, the head scarf is a different one than it is in Germany. And I think uh, now this is core Europe. If you go then to Turkey, where we have these, these uh, very difficult de developments over the last years, um, and these are issues I think we, we have to acknowledge the difference. We should not say, okay, we have Universal Declaration of Human Rights and that's it, and we have enough with that. And we have the edition documents. It is real life and it is so different across the world. If you hear, was it yesterday or the day before, people drowning. And then France and uh, England, the governments talk about, 
uh, we should take more care of the borders and uh, at, at, at the uh, people trading. Uh, we should, and this is a global issue, we should look more into the situation that migration is not needed, that you do not have to uh, move, that you can stay where you are, and if you have to move, that you can do it freely. These are issues, and they are different for different people, as simple as that. If I, if I could just add to that, and I think, I think what we have with... Um, sort of the current global governance mechanism um, are significant numbers of governments um, trying to withdraw from human rights mechanisms and the human rights architecture as we have understood it. Um, <clears throat> one thing that has, well, there's two things have jumped out actually. The first is in regards to the, the, the treatment of others through society in regards to um, people who have arrived for whatever reason um, into, into a country and how they're dehumanized um, and acceptably dehumanized. That's one, one thing. Um, the other thing is something that will catch up with us very quickly. And that is the way governments have been the drawing from um, any responsibilities around conflict and that is in relation to the privatization of war. And we can see that in particular across Africa, across the Middle East, and right through Syria, right through Afghanistan. What, what you had was particularly Western governments standing back and permitting private companies to take over the dirty work of war um, with... Um, the absolute disregard for human rights, particularly for civilians. Um, the outcome is the same as the government were, would have been involved, but in terms of the, the, just the mechanism of conflict, something has changed. And that something is that governments no longer um, feel the need to be responsible for war. And that is something that is on the horizon. And as I say, we can see that right across Africa, where in effect mercenaries are fighting the wars on behalf of every Western and other state um, to the detriment of, of those societies. And the up, 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 upshot of that is that we now have um, people escaping those wars, civilians escaping those wars and falling into that other trap of being refugees, asylum seekers and migrants and treated horribly, horribly. Um, at that point as well. And it's it's a sorry state of affairs driven by three things. Um, conflict, which is immensely profitable and always has been profitable. Um, we, we, just to throw a statistic in there, um, the West spent, um, it was $2 trillion on the Afghan war, one war, um, 100 billion a year. The second thing is climate change and the implications of that. Um, the, the, the sort of Western powers by and large benefiting from the worst excesses of, of climate abuse. Um, and the third thing is COVID. Um, COVID has become an excuse to um, withdraw from human rights. And it's a sorry state of affairs, I think, where we're at at the minute, where people who are escaping conflict that benefits a lot of our states um, are ending up drowning in the English Channel or indeed in the Mediterranean um, because the governments, by and large, through apathy, through opportunism, disregard the rights of those of those what is it, 35,000 dead in the Mediterranean um, because our governments couldn't muster the energy to try and save those people. And it's, a, it's an indictment of where global governance and politics is at at the minute. Um, and I'll, I'll, if Peter wants to add to that, 
go ahead. Peter, yeah, I saw uh, your you, hand. <laughs> you, you mentioned the dirty work of war. Uh, it is unfortunately not a dirty work anymore in some respect. People are sitting in the United States, pressing their buttons, sitting in front of monitor. And it's very clean work. Uh, they go uh, out of the office in the evening as other people do after marrying people or doing whatsoever. Uh, I think digitization is a very important point as well. I would add this to the three points you mentioned. And if we see the digitization in economic terms, if Mr. Bezos and uh, what, what was his other name is uh, so, so and so, uh, fly into space for one and a half hour, spending I don't know how much money for it. Uh, and this money could be used for very, very important things. We should think about this. If, and this is another thing of privatization, not only of war, but privatization of, of, uh, of governments and governments. Uh, the first time actually it happened when I heard in the news, I still was in Europe, um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Gates uh, meeting a French president or something, talking about the educational system of France. I thought, what, what is this about? Mr. Gates, he may be good in building computers. I don't know if he still is. The, the professional or, or being a professional uh, uh, philanthropist, I think this is an amazing thing that uh, all these people, all these enterprises have foundations. They spend huge amount of money. And I do not want to say that they're all spending the money on bad projects. There are definitely good projects as well. But how are they legitimized? The governments draw back, go step in, and what is then about rights? We have the right to ask Mr. Gates, ask Mr. Gensers, ask Mr. Uh, I don't know who, whomever, Mr. Zuckerberg, uh, to give us something. And the power that is concentrated there. Uh, there is no way of splitting up Facebook because Facebook has the needs people who uh, who are engaging it. It's, it's Facebook with two people is pretty boring. Um, but we have to look for government, not governance, government democratically legitimized uh, to control these and to control these very strict in terms of law. And this is something helping people as well, not getting lost in digital world, uh, but make, being able to, to use it. Phelan, I think we didn't hear you during the last minutes because um, these both are very, very heartily in there and you are as well. But I have to mention all together, we have a book launch. And so I would ask, was this one of the goals, Phelan, to give a possibility to change the perspective of people who are reading your book, to make them aware of their own possibilities in human rights living and their way to do something, to, to give them tools and to contribute how to understand whatever is needful in our society to maybe to bring human rights education into society was it an idea of the book for me that was the main idea of the book to be honest um and and also to um contextualize the the whole series of human rights mechanisms um, in a critical way, I suppose, because in my view, human rights are and remain and will continue to remain a set of struggle. Um, what we have today is different from what we had uh, in yesteryear in terms of uh, human rights and recognition of human rights and will be different in the future. And the, the mechanisms that we have today and the recognitions of rights that we have today are the, are the result of struggle, mm -hmm. centuries of struggle by human, human beings 
who came together and, and often by human beings who, um, who had limited resources. And I think that um, one of the things that we have with human rights mechanisms is that we have uh, mechanisms which are quite weak and they're quite weak in terms of enforcement, policing, simply because powerful forces in society wanted them weak because they didn't want them, they didn't want them strong. So we, we, we've got very limited uh, human rights mechanisms as it is in terms of their ability to uh, help us enforce the, the rights that we have at the moment or supposedly have at the moment. Uh, but what we should be looking at, looking at in terms of those mechanisms is how we can use them, use them as tools, use them as tools for campaigning, for, for making people aware of what their rights are and, and how they might actually be able to enforce them using the tools at their disposal. But there are lots of other tools at, at, the, disposal, at the disposal of people which are outside those mechanisms and they should continue to use those tools as well tools of lobbying, tools of campaigning, tools of protesting, tools of actually reaching for the stars, because ultimately we need people out there to reach for the stars, otherwise we'll never get there. Uh, we need people to be turning around saying that what, what we have at the moment is not sufficient to, to cater for the needs of people on this planet. And both Jared and Peter have pointed out some of the inadequacies of human rights and some of the difficulties. Um, and it seems to me that human rights have been used and abused by powerful interests down through the years, and um, uh, and human rights have been, you know, methods have been have been made to to ensure that human rights were not enforceable when they should have been enforceable. We talk about conflict. We have supposedly international humanitarian law, which is supposed to um, uh, minimise. The worst aspects of conflict. One of the difficulties with international humanitarian law, of course, is despite some innovations, like the 1977 protocols, um, they don't adequately cover conflicts which involve non-state actors. Um, they're primarily geared towards state actors, state, state armies, uh, state forces rather than non-state forces. And the vast majority of conflicts in the world today involve non-state actors. Um, so international humanitarian law, which is supposedly there to, to provide some element of rights for non-combatants and for civilians, um, it doesn't adequately cover um, most conflicts in the world today. And linked into that, because partly because of that, partly because of developments in war, partly because of what Peter said about the drone warfare uh, and uh, the ability to kill people, hundreds of miles away uh, without uh, uh, you know, putting yourself at risk. Um, that partly because of that, 90% of uh, casualties, up to 90% of casualties in war city are civilians. Um, so there are limitations with international human rights mechanisms. Um, uh, but that haven't been said. And to come back to your point, I mean, what is the goal or one of the goals of the books? One of the goals of the book, book is, to make people aware that first of all, there is such a thing as human rights and there are certain things that are supposed to protect you and are supposed to not just protect you, but actually allow you to live a fulfilling life. Um, so it's not just negative rights, there are positive rights, which governments are supposed to um, uh, uphold. Um, that, um, so it's about awareness raising. It's also about um, uh, capacity building making people aware of how they might be able to use the existing mechanisms uh, and, and when to use them. And also it's about raising confidence because you, know, you might know all about your rights and you might know how to use them, but you may not have the confidence to use them. And one way in which you get confidence is by joining together with other people who, who, who want to see change. Uh, and I suppose this is where NGOs and voluntary sector organizations are very, very important in, in, in terms of bringing together people. Uh, and and um, promoting confidence among people, and then ultimately, then the next thing is 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 to bring about change, change within the current current human rights mechanisms, but also change in terms of actually improving human rights mechanisms and advancing them. 
and and I think people Peter also made a number of points there in relation to socioeconomic rights. Um, ultimately, um, one of the biggest problems that exists in our society is the lack of socioeconomic rights. The, an ill-divided world, um, uh, ill-divided in terms of wealth and ill-divided in terms of power. And uh, we can see that with climate change. We can see that with uh, migration policy. And we can see that uh, with COVID. With 70% of the population of the world not having access to vaccines, for example, um, which says something about uh, our commitment to international human rights, I suppose. Thank you very much. I think it was something of a perfect conclusion to your book and maybe to the thinking for today. And for the audience, I may say, reading the book, I felt myself thinking very often that this is exactly what we should speak about. And very often I thought, yes, that is what exactly we should all do. So if you have an idea about what to do with your time and to use and read this book, I'm pretty sure it will inspire you to come in action and to rethink some ideas of the tools we all have and to rethink our doing what we are doing each day for everybody or even just for somebody. And hopefully it will be spread what is in there all over the world. And I hope for you and your book that you have a lot of people who will read it because I really think it is a very, very important and needful book, especially at the moment and during the times we have. Thank you so much for being here and giving us your time. And if there is something you want to say right now, so please give us maybe three sentences what everybody of us should think about human rights. Um, the, what I would say is that if people could read the preface by Albie Sachs, I think that that would be, and it's very, very short, but that would be very, very inspiring for, for many people, if they, if, even if they just managed to read that. Maybe we can put that up on the web, the preface. Okay. Well, I think it is actually on the web of the publisher, uh, freely available. Uh, so it is an inspiration. And what we should never forget, point two, from my side, uh, it is as well about discussing things and moving things forward and accepting that there are uh, different opinions on, on this, uh, individual topics. So not being shy uh, to say, okay, no, we, we have to agree on everything. Uh, we don't have to, uh, but we have to agree on uh, that's passing on to Joe. Um, and we have to agree that books should be available and accessible. And you mentioned something that there is a paperback version on the uh, soon on the market, I hope. So that's my third thing moving on in that direction. I hope you have good news there. And Stephanie, thanks very much for, for inviting us, giving us the opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you, Stephanie. And, and thank you, Fiona and Peter, as well, for contributing to this discussion. Just one, one final thought from me. I think it feeling was right and, and it, it runs right through this book in regards to the need to assert rights and to engage with the state in particular around their obligations to um, carry forward a rights agenda and rights policies. And also just a final thought on, on this. And I'm, I'm, I'm very conscious that it's, it's mostly the most vulnerable who are susceptible to rights abuses. And I think for, for those of us working in this field, um, we, sh we should always consider that, that that is where we should be primarily um, in regards to activities, activism, being with those people who um, are having their rights um, abused or taken away from them. So I, I'd leave it at that. And thank you, Stephanie, again, for, for organizing this. Oh, it's not for this. Thank you very much to you for having the time, for presenting the book. And 
at all of the gather for give us a chance to get an idea about the topic and what's in there. And it is a very critical book and that is what is really interesting. Yes. Okay. What do you think?